Okay, in this lecture, we're going to be deriving quite a few results. You won't be expected to be able to reproduce these derivations, but I do think it's important for you to see that these equations can be derived from the mechanics that you've already learned. So we'll be deriving an expression for the speed of a wave along a piece of string. We'll be deriving another expression for the cap for the power carried by a wave along a piece of string and you will need to use both these expressions. And then we'll be deriving the wave equation which is a bit, you won't be expected to be able to apply that in this course as it is a second order differential equation. After that we're going to have a look at what happens to pulses when they come to boundaries. We'll be looking at the reflection and transmission of the pulse at the boundary. And finally, we'll be looking at the principle of superposition and using it to derive an expression for when we have two waves which are identical apart from their phase in the one medium. This lecture will be covering sections 16.2 to 16.5 of your textbook. First of all, a quick recap of the most important ideas from last lecture. We saw that transverse waves were ones in which the particles that make up the medium oscillate in a direction perpendicular to the direction that the wave is travelling in. In longitudinal waves, the particles oscillate in the same direction that the wave travels. We saw that a pulse travelling to the right has a wave function y of xt is equal to some function of x minus vt. This minus comes about as it's travelling to the right in the positive direction. We went over some definitions for waves, which you probably saw in high school. The amplitude of a wave is the distance between the equilibrium position and the crest, or the trough. So it's two times the distance between the crest and the trough. The wavelength is the distance between two crests along the length of the wave. The period of the wave is how long it takes in time for one crest to pass you and then the next crest to pass you. The frequency is the inverse of the period and the velocity of the wave is equal to f lambda. This is a very important equation for you to know. Last lecture we also showed that the form of the wave equation was y of xt is equal to a sine kx minus omega t plus phi. The k is the wave number, it's not related to the spring constant, it's equal to 2 pi over lambda. The negative sign here indicates that it is travelling to the right. If the number in front of the x and the t have the same sign, it's travelling to the left. If they have opposite signs, it's travelling to the right. Omega is the angular of frequency, it's equal to 2 pi f. And phi is the phase constant, which lets us match this wave up with our initial conditions. This is a transverse wave as this displacement is in the y direction while the wave is travelling in the x direction. We're now going to derive a formula for the speed of wave on the string. Here's the pulse that we're going to be considering is travelling from the left to the right along the screen here. Now imagine yourself in the reference frame of the pulse. So you're travelling along at the top of the pulse here. You're this increment delta s. What you see is increments of the rope going past you. They'll be travelling to the left. Okay, now let's consider what's happening in this case. Delta S is a little arc length here. R is the radius of our semicircular hump. Theta is the angle between the middle of our arc length and the edge of our arc length. So the total angle in here is 2 theta. So from our equations for arc length, we know that the length delta s is equal to 2 r theta because the angle is 2 theta and the radius of our semicircle is r. Now we're going to have a think about all the forces acting on the system. We have tension pulling the string down in this direction. We have tension pulling the string down in that direction. Those are the two forces acting on it. And the result is that this undergoes circular motion. And so the resultant force is equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration. This makes the geometry a bit more clear. The tension is pulling on the end of this increment 
down here and on the end of this increment here. Because the radius makes an angle of 90 degrees with the circumference of the circle, this is 90 in here, so this angle in here is equal to theta. Okay, so that's just the same picture again. Now what we do is we move this tension here, this tension here, so that we're adding them head to tail. When we do that, we know that our resultant force is the mass times the centripetal acceleration. So looking at the geometry, this angle in here was theta, which tells us this angle here is theta. So half the length down here is T sine theta. So the length of this resultant force is 2T sine theta. So that's why we've got this 2T sine theta here. And here is our centripetal acceleration. Now we're going to make the small angle approximation. If theta is small, then sine theta is approximately theta. So we can replace this sine theta here with theta. That's what we've done here. Now what we need to do is work out this mass here. So the mass of a piece of string is equal to the density per unit length of the string times the length of the string. But we've already shown that the length delta s is equal to 2r theta because it was the arc of that circle. So we can say that the mass of the piece of string is the linear density times 2r theta. So now we're just going to substitute that in. Here's our resultant force, 2t theta, and here's the m v squared on r term, and m has been replaced with this expression here. Now there's lots of things we can cancel out. We can cancel out our thetas, we can cancel out the twos, we can cancel out the r's, and when we do that, we're left with the expression t is equal to mu, the mass per unit length, times the velocity squared. So we can rearrange that to write that the velocity is equal to the square root of the tension over the mass per unit length. Now you'll be using this formula quite a lot and this will come up in the standing waves on the string experiment in the laboratory. To practice using it, you should try homework set 5. For 1121, try problem 13. 1131, try problem 17. Now we assumed that this was a semicircular pulse. It actually turns out that the shape doesn't matter. Any shape can be approximated as a semicircle at the very top. So actually the pulse shape or the wave shape is unimportant. This equation holds for any wave shape. Now we also assume that the tension T along the string was constant so that this pulse traveling along the string was not affecting the tension. That's only true if the pulse is fairly small. If the pulse is very large, then it's going to cause the string to stretch and that's going to add some extra tension. We'll see later that this equation can actually be generalized. We'll be seeing it for sound waves. But we can actually generalize it to the velocity is equal to some elastic property, in this case the tension, over some inertial property, in this case the mass per unit length. For a sound wave, it ends up being the bulk modulus, given the symbol B, over the density of the per unit volume of the material that the wave is traveling through. Here's a fairly easy question for you to practice using the equation that we've just derived. A uniform string has a mass of 0 0.300 kilograms and a length of 6.00 meters. The string passes over a pulley and supports a 2.00 kilogram object. Find the speed of a pulse traveling along the string. Enter your answer into the box below the question.